Well, um, welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to learn a little bit about how to conduct legal research. I'm going to go ahead and shut the camera off so that our attention can be directed at the slides and I'll turn it back on at the end of the presentation. All right, so um, as a threshold matter, I think it's important for us to talk about what is legal research. And that seems like it would be a very easy question to answer. It's just like any topic that may be presented in our daily lives, um, but the focus is on something that is law related. Um, but to provide you with a more formal definition, it's the process of identifying and retrieving information necessary to support legal decision making. So legal research is going to include each step of a course of action that's going to begin with analysis of the facts of a problem and will ultimately conclude with the application and communications of the results of that investigation. So when I think about legal research, and probably when you think about legal research, um, you're going to think about tasks um, such as finding primary sources of law or primary authority in a given jurisdiction, possibly searching secondary authority for background information about a legal topic, or even searching non-legal sources for investigative or supporting information. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about each one um, of these different tasks that we might conduct um, as we complete our legal research. First of all, um, we need to think about what different types of authorities are available to us as we begin our research. And I start with this just to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as an understanding of what's out there for us to use as a resource. Um, conducting research can be very expensive, and so knowing the authorities that are available and how to get the most bang for our buck um, uh, to use a, a slang, um, some slang terminology, is going to be imperative to us. So um, there are many different types of authority that are available. You'll see I've provided two columns, one um, that lists our primary authority and the other that includes um, available secondary authority. So I tell you, um, even uh, as a law school professor, the differences between persu persuasive and mandatory authority can get confusing. Um, by understanding these differences and knowing what resources are appropriate for us when conducting our research, it will make our lives so much easier and our writing will be so much stronger for um, the individuals that are reading it. So all legal information we should know as a threshold matter comes from either primary or secondary sources. All primary sources can either be mandatory or persuasive authority. However, the good news is um, secondary authority is always going to be persuasive. So at least we'll always um, know if we start with one of the different types of the secondary authority that it's going to be uh, persuasive versus mandatory on the court that we're appearing in front of. So if we do look at that second column labeled secondary authority, we know that this is where we should look for background information on a particular legal issue. But um, this isn't going to be the type of authority that we're going to choose to cite in our papers, especially if there's other primary authority available. Um, so, for example, the first item listed under secondary authority is encyclopedias. And um, encyclopedias, um, it's, it's similar to a regular encyclopedia. Um, it's like a horn book or American jurisprudence. It's great because it provides us with very useful background information. It informs the person that's doing the research ourselves of major cases that are out there on a particular topic, and it will familiarize or acquaint the reader with very useful terminology. Sometimes there's um, state-based encyclopedias, and those are fantastic in that they provide us with an advantage of focusing on the law in that particular jurisdiction. 
On the other side, when we're looking at primary authority, um, what do those sources do for us? Well, they articulate the law. So I have listed the Constitution, um, administrative regulations, um, also agency decisions would go hand in hand with these administrative regulations, statutes and case law. Now, this one is when it gets a little uh, more tricky. Um, when we look at this primary authority, we need to know that sometimes it's going to be persuasive and sometimes it's going to be mandatory. So the difference. Mandatory authority is going to refer to cases, statutes, or regulations um, that the court must follow because it's binding on that court. Thus, if a, the Supreme Court in the land has made a decision, the lower courts in that jurisdiction are going to be required to follow the decisions from the higher court, that highest court, or any higher courts within that same jurisdiction. So um, you're thinking, well, then wait a second. <laughs> How can primary authority um, be persuasive then if I have a constitution or administrative regulation? Well, this refers to cases, statutes, regulations, or secondary authority even. Um, the, these are the sources that the court may follow, but it really doesn't have to follow. So the holding from a court in another jurisdiction or a lower court in the same jurisdiction is going to be persuasive authority. Um, and so let's, let's talk a little bit more about that why it's so important for us to understand the interplay between primary authorities and um, it being persuasive versus um, binding. Well, when you're writing a memorandum, um, and that's generally the type of document that you will write for uh, maybe someone in your law firm or um, a brief that you're submitting to the court, you have to cite to relevant mandatory authority. If it's there, you have to include it. If you don't, immediately the court will think, why wasn't this cited? Um, if the individual didn't cite to the authority in their um, brief or memorandum, what else are they not including? All of a sudden, your credibility as an attorney will be questioned because you're not being forthcoming with all of the authority that's available that's primary authority. So um, if we're considering citing to persuasive authority, um, we could do so if no mandatory authority exists or we're just adding it to support the mandatory authority that has already been cited. So we should never start with secondary authority if we have mandatory, mandatory um, uh, binding authority available. While primary sources articulate the law, secondary sources are available to analyze the law. So, for example, uh, a Fourth Circuit case is a primary source but an article analyzing that case would be a secondary source, just to make things a little more simple. So definitely you can cite to secondary sources and persuasive authority in legal documents, but you've got to make sure you know when it's going to be appropriate. Um, the strongest persuasive authority will likely be primary authority from a higher court or a court of the same level. So I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, if I were going to um, cite a case, I would definitely, um, if I had a case in Florida, I'd want to cite to the Florida Supreme Court if it was a state issue. However, if there wasn't anything in Florida on a particular issue, maybe it's a new statute that was enacted. Um, in Georgia, uh, the state that uh, is right next door to us, um, a very strong persuasive authority would likely be um, from that Georgia Supreme Court. Um, and I want you to also keep in mind, um, just to make things a little more complicated, that authority from some jurisdictions might be more persuasive than authority from other jurisdictions. So uh, what do I mean by that? So uh, on a political note, um, decisions from some of the conservative circuits might not be well received in some liberal circuits, while you know, on the, on, the, on the opposite end, decisions from liberal circuits might not be very persuasive in uh, conservative courts. So, for example, the Fourth and the Ninth Circuit um, in the United States might not give much weight to each other's decisions. 
If you can find a relevant primary source, either mandatory or persuasive, it's generally not a good idea to cite the secondary sources, is the, the moral to the story. So, however, if there's no primary authority in the subject, um, that would be the time period for you to use these secondary sources. I've included a quick example for us to look at, something um, that's visible on the screen. Um, I'll give you just a second um, to read it to yourself um, and come up with an answer for the those of you that are online with me right now. Um, if you will, uh, type in true or false um, to the question when you've had the opportunity to look at it. I'll, I'll give you about uh, 20 seconds. All right. Oh, no one's giving me an answer. Okay, I will give the answer. Um, so three, two, one. Okay, the answer is going to be, um, it's going to be false. It's not going to be um, binding. Um, we have new as the first word in each of the states, but um, we're looking at um, the New York um, uh, highest court. Um, uh, uh, interpreting a New York statute. Um, yes, New Jersey definitely has the same statute, we're told, but that in and of itself isn't going to make it binding. Um, so uh, the answer is going to be false. It certainly is going to be highly persuasive, especially um, the proximity of those two um, states. Uh, they, they definitely um, would look to one another for guidance um, if there was um, an area of the law that had not been addressed yet. So we've talked a little bit about um, knowing the different authority that's out there because it's really difficult to conduct research um, if you don't know where you'll be doing the research. But, you know, there's also the key part of you need to understand the topic that you're going to be researching. So how do we even prepare um, as attorneys uh, we might have the opportunity to practice in a new area of the law. We might work for a law firm in which we're given all types of different um, things to research. And um, something new comes across our desk and we need to be efficient, um, not only with our time, but our use of the electronic um, uh, programs that we have available because of the costs associated with them. So how do we go about ensuring um, we understand the best approach to uh, getting ready to research. Well, the ability to conduct legal research is essential um, for lawyers. It's really, it doesn't matter regardless of the area of the law um, that you end up practicing in or that you're currently practicing in. The most basic step in, in legal research is to find the statute or the leading case governing the issues in question. As veteran researchers and even new researchers know quickly, this is very, um, this is far more difficult than it sounds. Sometimes the issues are not um, correctly identified or some issues are missed altogether. So issue identification is going to be crucial for effective research. I want you to think about why that is, why it's so difficult to frame legal issues. Well. If we're meeting with clients that uh, don't aren't familiar with the law, they're ignorant as to the statutes and cases that are out there, to legal terminology like strict liability and negligence, then many times we are dealing with how they have framed a, a situation in their own words versus in legal terminology. So it's our job to figure out where we need to begin. So where do we begin? So clearly we need to be familiar with various resources, but that's not all. You also need to formulate research strategies that tell which source of several sources you should consult. And your strategy has to incorporate flexibility. Successful researchers continually reevaluate reevaluate their research methodology and consider alternative research approaches as they find that various sources or research approaches are helpful or fruitless. Regretfully, sometimes they are fruitless. So even more importantly, you also need to learn how to advance your analysis of a law-related problem by means of your research. 
Even the most diligent researcher armed with the latest technology will not arrive at a successful result if he or she approaches legal research as a mechanical process devoid of analysis. Thus, legal research is really just a portion of legal problem serving, problem solving. So what do we do? Well, we have our resources now. We know um, where to go, right? We know um, what's going to be binding versus persuasive. We know that we have to be flexible because we might come up with um, no information the first time around because we need to become educated on a particular topic. So one of the first steps that we need to embark upon is identifying search terms. So here is an example um, of maybe a, a case that might come up. What if we were researching a case in which a dog owner was sued because her dog bit someone? How um, would we know where to find the law in that particular jurisdiction? What might be some words that we use to conduct our source? So again, I'll give you just a um, few seconds to think about where you would start. If you um, would like those online with me, feel free to type in um, two or three words that you would use to conduct your search. Okay, well, I would, of course, um, hopefully start with dog, right? We need to make sure we have um, that we're looking for something that has occurred because of a dog. Uh, also, for liability purposes, um, I would be thinking about who is responsible, and that would be the owner. Now, some other things that might not be as clear immediately um, would be that term uh, liability, right? That's not um, set forth in the question that I've posed. Something else, what would the causes of action be? Now, if I've had a torts class, then I'm familiar with the terminology negligence and strict liability because I probably have read a case involving a situation in which a dog has bit someone before, but a member of our um, general public might not be as familiar with that same terminology. So definitely strict liability and negligence um, would be two areas of the law that I would want to see if there were possible causes of action available. So I'd include those as search terms. But what else? Hmm. If, some, uh, if a dog bit someone, would it matter where it occurred? Well, in the state of Florida, it does. So I'd also want to see public versus private property um, might be search terms that I would add. Now, I can tell you there's not a 100% correct way to approach legal research or even um, these search terms that we identify. We have to be flexible, right? Um, successfully re successful researchers continually reevaluate re their research methodology. And so we'll come up with different approaches based on the results that we um, receive. So um, just one preview into the type of research that you could conduct. Now, I say the search is on. <laughs> now we have an understanding of where we should start. Right, um, our jurisdiction, and I didn't talk uh, much about um, jurisdiction. I uh, made an assumption, which I shouldn't have. Let me uh, talk about that just for a second. Jurisdiction um, basically um, is where a case should be heard. Um, it draws its substance from maybe public international law, conflicts of law, constitutional law, um, in the U.S., the powers of the executive and legislative branches of government. Um, it basically, uh, they allocate resources to best serve the needs of society. Um, this is a practical authority that's granted to a legal body to administer justice within a defined area of responsibility. So, um, for example, um, in the Middle District of Florida here in Jacksonville, um, it hears uh, admiralty cases. 
There are certain cases, like bankruptcy cases, that are heard solely in this federal court. Um, in federations like the U.S., um, areas of jurisdiction will apply to local, state, and federal levels. So, for example, the court, um, the Michigan tax law, um, this the court that would hear that case has jurisdiction to apply federal law. So once we do identify the jurisdiction, we have to decide whether to start with secondary or primary authority. And I've got to tell you that um, I've read lots of um, legal writing textbooks. That's my um, uh, area of specialty um, in teaching. Um, some authors will say that it's always great to start with secondary sources, um, whereas uh, there are time periods when it's appropriate to start with primary authority. Here is what I've discovered over the years with my research and what I think most authors would uh, agree with. If you have already had some familiarity with a given area of the law, you might even be able to identify a statute or case and start there. So when I first um, graduated from law school and began practice, um, my first year working for uh, an attorney, I was amazed. He, um, and this is telling you how long ago um, I graduated <laughs> and I practiced uh, law, um, but uh, they required me my first year as an attorney to use a dictaphone, right? The tape record yourself. They said it was quicker for me to um, talk than it was to type. And so I was amazed because I would watch um, the uh, senior partner, my mentor at the time, and he would walk around the office with the stick to phone and he could just talk um, uh, without even looking at Westlaw or Lexis or any of the research programs. Um, because he remembered um, the, the numbers of the statutes. For example, Florida Statute 767.04. Now, I remember um, it's a statute that addresses um, insurance um, disputes. 767.428, it deals with attorneys and award of attorney's fees. So if I have that information, if I already know that, okay, um, this is definitely um, governed by Chapter 6, 767 of the Florida Statutes, maybe I don't need to start with a secondary source. I can go straight to my primary authority because I know it um, by number or by name already. Whereas, if it is new to me, um, let's say I'm working on a pro bono case, I'm volunteering, you know, I want to get um, some exposure to a new area of the law, I want to help the underserved in the community, then um, maybe I need to consider starting with a secondary authority to learn about that area of the law. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a new attorney, it was scary um, what I didn't know. So you didn't even know what you didn't know um, is what I talked to um, our uh, law students about at Florida Coastal. Um, it's amazing what you can learn, um, but you don't want to make silly mistakes by not doing your homework and making assumptions. So if you start with a secondary authority of the law, you can learn about that new area. Something as easy as um, not understanding the burden when you um, plead something in a complaint, you could shift the burden of proof, um, something that you, you definitely don't want to do. So um, by researching that secondary authority additionally, um, this will help us identify the key terms to use to search for authority within our particular jurisdiction. If we're lucky, um, there might even be a publication like, for example, Florida Jurisprudence, in which there's an analysis, analysis of the law on a particular topic. To go back to the search terms that we identified for the dog bite situation, there is just that on dog bites. Um, there are many different sections that address um, dog bites, uh, whether they occur on private uh, versus public property, how liability may ensue, um, there's defenses that are available under the statute, um, and there's also, you know, who actually constitutes an owner under that statute. So it's very interesting um, that we can really learn a lot by knowing where to look. So should we always start our research by locating secondary sources? Hopefully um, we've come up with the answer uh, to that. that no, um, you know, if we're already knowledgeable in a topic area, there's no reason for us to do that. 
What about internet searching? Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes if there's a legal issue that is presented, I'll just get on Google or Bing and go out and um, type in um, uh, the couple of the, the words um, and see if I can come up with some basic information. Uh, I do that all the time when designing problems for my classes. Uh, let's see what's been, uh, what's happened on this particular topic. Is there uh, a case out there in which um, something like this has occurred? Um, for example, I was looking at assault um, as a possible topic for my uh, first year, first semester legal writing class about um, Let's see, about nine months ago, and what came up was there was a um, an individual that was upset with a fast food restaurant, and he had taken a baby alligator and threw it through the window of a fast food restaurant. Uh, yes, he was arrested, and the question was uh, whether or not he was guilty of um, assault and battery. Uh, my students absolutely loved the problem because they couldn't believe, um, I think this is why they loved the problem, that they couldn't believe someone did this, um, and it was something that was going on at the time. Um, they were writing on a topic um, that hadn't been decided as of yet. They were able to go out to other jurisdictions and see um, what they tried to find was um, somewhat similar, but they didn't have anything right on point in their current jurisdiction or outside of it. So, you know, they did some internet searching. They found um, what was written as far as the articles from uh, different publications, but not a legal publication. Now, so you can gather information certainly by doing internet searching. However, I caution you, um, it doesn't make sense um, as attorneys for us to cite to um, Wikipedia, right? Um, again, it's kind of like other secondary sources. It's great to get us up to speed and educate us about the topic, but they're not, um, if we're in front of a judge in the United States, the judge is not going to recognize that as um, highly persuasive, um, well, I guess it's persuasive, but maybe not highly persuasive authority and certainly not binding on the court. So the research process. Uh, I tell you what, one of the favorite um, questions uh, that students have to ask, and I try to preempt it, is, you know, um, should you stop researching just because you find a few cases or statute that seem to address your issue, right? Do you, you know, you know is, is three the magical number? Is 10 the magical number? Is there some type of correlation between the number of pages that you have to write and the number of authorities that should be cited? Regretfully, there's not a bright line answer um, to that question. So how do you really know when you're done? Well, um, one thing that I think um, tells me that I'm done is when I keep coming up with the same results over and over again. And I have read all of those primary authorities. Um, I've already reviewed several secondary authorities to ensure that I'm not missing something that may be what I believe to be extraneous to the issue, but also it could end up being um, binding, right? It could end up having a huge impact if I'm not familiar with it. You have to update all your authority you rely on for your analysis, um, but once you see them appearing over and over again, then that's a good indicator um, that you are um, complete and um, that you want to start writing. So what's the very last thing that you need to do after your research is complete? Well, you need to go back and check your sources to ensure they are still good law. Um, I can tell you that some people are great about you know jumping in with both feet when something is assigned, um, whether it be through your law school classes right now or possibly um, through the law firm that you're employed by. Um, you know, maybe you've got something and it's due 30 days out. Um, you go in, you do your research, you um, set it aside uh, electronically or you print it out. Um, then you go, go uh, back a few weeks later and you write. Well, um, it's important that you make sure that, that information is still good law. Um, I remember I wrote an article um, for um, a law school journal and I, throughout a semester, 
just kept putting things aside, putting things aside. Um, I had over a hundred sources, I remember. And I finally sat down and I wrote, um, got it all done. And the time it took to check the sources um, was comparable to the time that it took me to um, write um, certain parts of the paper. So it's a lot of work, um, but it's very important because you never want to get in front of a judge and have a situation in which the judge says, but counsel, that's not good law. Um, why are you citing that? I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that if we don't um, present um, certain authority as part of our work um, that's binding, then the court's going to question our credibility. Same thing, if we're citing to bad law, um, the court is definitely going to um, start um, questioning our uh, credibility. We don't want that. I wanted to include a discussion of ethical rules that govern attorney conduct, um, specifically geared towards when we research and prepare legal documents, because I think that's imperative. Um, so many times uh, people don't think that there are rules that govern attorney um, behavior when it comes to writing, and there are absolutely um, many rules uh, that do just that. So um, first of all, uh, the American Bar Association is an organization which is fantastic. It provides us um, with leadership in legal ethics uh, through the adoption of um, certain professional standards. And they're really just a model of the law that govern um, attorney behavior in the practice of law. Um, they first came about with the Canons of Professional Ethics in 1908, and the latest version of these standards is the Model Rules of Professional Conduct. Um, that was They were first adopted in 1983, and they've been amended um, a couple of times, uh, maybe a number of times since then. Um, if you were looking up the Model Rules of Professional Conduct, they consist of a preamble, a statement that uh, basically addresses their scope, and there's about 60 rules um, that are divided into eight subject areas. Um, after each rule, there's a comment that explains certain parts of the rule. Um, these model rules uh, replace the model code of professional conduct uh, that was adopted in 1969. Um, what I want you to know is they're not binding on anyone, um, but they really just serve as a model that can be adopted by the states. Um, so for those of you that have read cases um, and you've looked at things like the restatement of contracts or the restatement of torts, um, again, that's a publication in which it's highly um, persuasive, it's a great resource, but unless it's actually adopted by a state, um, it's not going to be binding. Um, the good news is that um, uh, even if these codes or rules of professional conduct um, haven't been um, uh, specifically adopted by a state, these states have gone in um, and uh, created their own rules. And many, if not all, the states have used the ABA model rules of professional conduct as a um, basis um, for creating um, their rules. So um, most are not adopted by the legislature, interestingly enough, of the states, but instead the uh, state bar associations um, or the highest court of the jurisdiction um, adopt the rules uh, that govern their attorney's conduct. So, for example, in Florida, we have the Florida Rules of Professional Conduct, um, and uh, we have the Florida Supreme Court, um, which is in charge um, of um, reviewing those rules, any type of um, uh, problem with those, well, not problems, but attorneys that don't follow those rules um, would have to uh, go before our Florida um, Board of Bar Examiners um, to have whatever um, legal uh, infraction, I'll use that terminology, addressed. So each state has adopted its own rules. Um, I want you to keep in mind that with this legal research, again, to tie it back together with the presentation, there's some basic skills um, that each uh, legal researcher needs to possess, that we should possess. Um, a successful legal researcher possesses foundational knowledge of the legal system and legal information sources, um, two topics that we've already addressed today. 
A successful legal researcher gathers information through effective and efficient research strategies. I want you to think about that one for a second. Um, we can't bill our client um, for uh, inefficient research, for spending hours and hours on learning a particular topic when it's something um, that you should be able to uh, identify quickly. A successful legal researcher critically evaluates information. A, a successful legal researcher applies information effectively to resolve a specific issue or need. Finally, a successful legal researcher can distinguish between ethical and unethical uses of information and understands the legal issues associated with the discovery, use, or application of that information, which um, brings me to, I want to um, provide a quick, um, not quick, but a, t spend a few minutes on some specific rules that are promul promulgated by the American Bar Association and have been adopted um, in their entirety by um, many states. So rule 1.1, Competence. Um, we have to provide competent representation to our clients. It requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the presentation. Well, what does that what does that necessarily mean when it comes to sufficiency of research? Well, once the lawyer has a basic understanding of the facts that give rise to a legal issue, he has to properly, or she, properly research the law in order to protect, predict a result. This requires the lawyer to have some basic level of competence with regard to locating and evaluating the applicable law. So if we were to look at the comment to this rule, 1.1, it makes clear, because I'll quote, that competent handling of a particular matter includes inquiry into and analysis of the factual and legal elements of the problem and use of methods and procedures meeting the standards of competent practitioners. So what does that mean? And um, that's comment five, by the way, um, to that rule. The lawyer's obligation to adequately research and analyze the law is imposed under the federal rules of civil procedure as well. Um, and where does that come into play? Well, as attorneys, when we submit documents um, to the court in federal court, we have to comply with a rule um, known as Rule 11. And it basically gives assurances that um, it's not frivolous that we've done a reasonable inquiry under the circumstances that any claim, any defense, um, any other um, contentions that we are going to make are they, that there's a good basis um, of existing under the existing law. So, um, and that's Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 11B, Sections 2 and 3. And there's a multitude of cases in which attorneys have regretfully been found in violation um, of that rule. What about um, looking at Rule 1.3 and diligence? What does that mean? We have to act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. Um, so we, we definitely, um, in the context of letter writing, in the context of um, appearance in front of courts um, and our communications with clients overall, we have an obligation to represent the client uh, diligently. Um, and so um, what does that mean? Uh, we're basically looking at um, the need to encourage lawyers to keep in communication with our clients in the form of providing status letters to them at reasonable intervals. Um, what I did in practice is anytime anything came in um, on a case, I prepared anything in connection with a, um, a client's representation, I would send a copy. Um, of course, that would immediately trigger a phone call. I've got this um, document that you sent. Um, it's a request to produce documents. What does it mean? Um, even the letters that, that you know, I would send out, and you guys probably inter um, have the same uh, situation, those of you that have, have practiced law in the United States, um, that immediate call, can you please explain um, what it is that you just sent? So, um, you know, I, I went to um, an ethics um, continuing legal education class in the state of Florida, and the Florida Board of Bar Examiners were there, and they said the number one, um, almost tied for number one, I should say, dispute um, that 
uh, happens between clients and attorneys, um, I'll tell you both of them. The first is lack of communication. So my client, my um, attorney isn't calling me. My attorney is not telling me um, what's going on with my case. And then number two, um, it might be tied at this point. I'm not sure what the stats are for this past year. Um, the other one was a disagreement um, regarding um, money, right, the funds. So um, it's important for us to keep in communication, to act uh, diligently with our communications with our client by providing um, status. There may be um, a period of time during which little transpires on client matters, um, but clients still resent a lack of communication, uh, especially if you're sending out um, a monthly billing statement. So you need to think about that, right? Um, we need to make sure that we're in contact with our client at least as often as we're sending our billing statements out. Um, Lawyers can be sanctioned for neglecting a client matter when the client raises a legitimate claim regarding a lack of um, communication from the lawyer. And um, those uh, different types of punishment come from things as, um, as easy as just a, um, a written reprimand um, to, uh, I, it would have to be extremely severe, I imagine, but even a suspension of your license. A failure to respond to a client request for information either by status letter or phone call can um, contact can um, result in um, client neglect. So we've got to be very careful about that. I mentioned um, Rule 11 when I was talking about um, one of the ethical rules and making sure we were competent. Um, a lawyer has to make sure that we have a good faith basis for bringing an action, not just to harass um, someone. Um, so we have to be very careful um, about this. We as attorneys um, have an obligation to exercise independent professional judgment and to render um, candid advice. Um, and in rendering that advice, um, we can refer not only to the law, but to other considerations uh, such as moral, economic, social, and political factors um, that might be relevant um, to a client situation. Um, we, are, as a, as a, a, uh, we serve as advisors to clients. Um, so that condones our reference to sometimes non-legal even considerations um, when interacting with a client about a particular situation. Um, we can give, you know, of course, that um, advice in a client meeting, in a client letter. Um, if we, for whatever reason, fail to adequately explain the law to a client, as well as the legal options that are available to the client, to the um, client, that can give rise to sanctions under the ethical rules. It could also subject the lawyer to a claim of um, legal malpractice. I haven't even talked about that. That's a complete um, separate uh, uh, obligation. So one with maybe our local bar and another um, where the client could bring an action against us. Um, so uh, the last uh, rule that I want to talk about is fairness to opposing counsel and to um, possibly if someone were representing themselves pro se, right, they didn't have an attorney. Um, we as officers of the court in the United States have an obligation to always be um, honest, um, not to purposely purposefully misrepresent information. Um, we can't let our client get up on the stand and lie. Um, uh, we can't um, disallow and um, inhi uh, inhibit someone from being able to get access to information. How does that tie back to our research? Um, we have an obligation when we're appearing in court, um, when we're uh, communicating with the opposing counsel, to be forthcoming. Now. Do we have to um, uh, you know, make the, the worst case for our client, the first case that we cite in our memorandum? No, um, but we certainly have to present that negative authority and explain how it does not apply um, to um, our situation, how we can distinguish it um, in our situation. And that's what really makes 
a good attorney. Um, when Natalie introduced me, she mentioned that I had the opportunity to um, intern at the Florida Supreme Court. Um, I tell you, um, I knew when there were good attorneys um, uh, writing memorandums because what would happen is um, you would have the initial um, brief that was written and then the responsive brief and then the reply brief by the original party that filed the appeal. And so um, I would, uh, my job was to read um, both um, parties' positions, summarize them, and then to write my own uh, for the judge that I was clerking for. I um, clerked for um, Justice Leander Shaw. And I know um, many of times I would read one brief and I'd say, oh, yeah, they're definitely going to win. <laughs> and then I had the opportunity to read the next one. And I was like, oh, no, 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 they're going to win. And I would summarize both sides, then do my own research and say, okay, now I, I know who should really win um, based on uh, what was written. And that's good lawyering, right? If you are able to present the information, you do your research um, efficiently, you make your arguments effectively, and you are able to present the law in such a way that you're being forthcoming um, to the court, uh, then that is what makes a good lawyer.